the Gym Channel podcast, bringing you the big picture on geoscientific information management through interviews and discussions. Welcome to the Gym Channel. Our podcast channel features guest speakers from the natural resources industries with an interest and focus on digital technologies and geoscientific information management. If you're enjoying our podcast series, please leave some feedback through your podcast player or on Apple Podcasts. We love to hear from our community. Our guest today is Stuart Vanderwater, and we're talking about environmental data management. Stuart is my colleague from Acquire's Adelaide office, and Stu heads up the environmental part of Acquire's business. Hey, Stu, welcome to the uh, Gym Channel podcast. How are you today? Yeah, good, thanks, Stephen, and yourself? I'm very good, thanks. Good to be talking to you. Yeah, you too. Good. So first off, could I get you please to tell us a bit about yourself, your career, and your role now as Acquire's environmental leader? Yeah, can do, absolutely. So I, I guess I've been in the software industry for over 20 years now, and uh, I've been with the uh, environmental product that we have for about 15 years, so I feel like I'm dating myself there a little bit. Um, I've always been very passionate about software side, and I actually did start my career as a developer. Um, so a lot of the uh, Enviruses product, um, which we'll reference today, is a lot of the older stuff was built by me, um, for good or for worse. So I guess when um, something goes wrong these days, the, the newer developers tend to blame me. But um, uh, over, over time, I've, I've grown um, with the product and the role um, and have you know got into the management side. And um, I guess uh, being with Acquire, you know, I've now got the opportunity to um, to head up the environmental uh, value stream, which is really exciting. So, um, you know, the, the nature of our business is to grow and also potentially look at um, uh, other products and uh, offerings which we can um, uh, put into the acquire uh, company in order to to uh, i guess have those for our customers for solutions and um, i get to you know help build that portfolio and and manage that for um uh, to really you know round out the sort of offerings that we have which is really exciting so yeah it's um been it's been a long time in the space and um it's um definitely a changing uh, landscape in the last few years cool thank you for that so today's topic, what we're talking about, is avoiding an environmental data manager's fool's gold. Can you please explain what you mean by an environmental data manager's fool's gold? Yeah, it can do. Um, especially a lot of our customers are mining. It seemed to be a good play on words. But um, what we do find, and and, and I think if um, those who have managed the data uh, listening to this will uh, very, very much resonate with, is that um, the fool's gold, I guess you can really um, – distill it down to uh, something like a spreadsheet um, or uh, what we call a glorified spreadsheet that um, simply just thinking that you can, um, you know, as long as you're storing the data somewhere and have it available so you can um, run the reports when you need to or, or collate data when you need to um, is enough. Um, it, um, it, we, what we find is that it, it inherently causes issues. The, um, there's a lot of things to consider outside of that. Um, especially when we're talking about environmental data, um, because there is such a broad depth um, to the amount of information and, and activities that need to occur. There's, it's a, actually a really, really interesting subject matter, very much multidisciplinary. So, you know, we're talking everything from the obvious things like water quality and, and air quality right through to, you know, biodiversity, uh, land management, flora and fauna, um, emissions, uh, it really can be quite all encompassing. So, you know, what we find is that um, you know, people often go, well, you know, as long as I've got the ability to store that data, then I'll be able to utilize it and um, and do what I need to do with it. And we find that that just, you know, unfortunately, and to, to pardon another mining pun, uh, digs a bigger hole. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, yeah, that was good. Um, so, I'm just interested to know a bit more about the the profile of your typical customer what does your typical customer uh, look like what do they what do they do and what do they want from you what are they looking to get from from Enviruses? yeah the the typical customer like we said in definitely in the resources sector very heavily in mining but um, also a little bit in the oil and gas industry as well um, i guess it's really independent of the commodity it's just a general need for um, companies who let's face it a lot of the companies aren't doing environmental monitoring um, because they're they're good corporate citizens. Uh, there is always some sort of regulatory driver around this. So there's always um, the the process of of um, working with a government, for example, to ensure that the 
the, I guess, the compliance and the um, obligations around what a company needs to do when they're disturbing the earth, the, the air, the water, those sort of things um, in terms of making sure that they don't leave the earth in a bad state. So yep. um, I don't want to be too cynical around the companies not caring about this because mm -hmm. what we do find is that the people involved are very passionate environmental professionals. So sure. um, really uh, important that you know they do come to us looking for an end-to-end -end solution. They say, look, we need something that can manage all of this because it is a lot to do. Uh, we've got, uh, and I guess the other thing about our typical customers is, uh, and they are probably some of the worst funded um, people's and departments uh, in an organisation. Mm. Um, so you're talking about people who don't have a lot of resources, uh, need something that'll really help them uh, become that expert and um, ensure that they can really, at any point in time, you know, answer that question. You know, as a company, are we compliant right now with our environment? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Can you? Bring this to life for us a bit. What, kind, what kinds of problems um, are these companies faced with when they're managing their environmental data? Um, yeah, there's it's just such a broad variety, and I guess it comes down to um, being able to manage everything from one minute data, you know, thirty second data coming from devices in the field, through to that one sample that needs to be done every quarter. And you can imagine then you've got so much noise with a lot of the real-time data coming through um, compared to that one that comes through every quarter. But funny enough, the one that comes through every quarter can be directly linked to one of their um, permits or, or obligations. So if they don't do that or if they fail to report that, they can actually be in trouble. So um, a lot of it is around the manual handling of the data, the quality of the data. Um, and as we know these days, and it seems to be getting... Um, a little bit worse we've noticed in the last few months is around um, people changing jobs. So we've noticed in our space, a lot of the environmental um, professionals have been moving around, um, which means that, you know, we often find if they're not utilising a system like ours, like an EDMS, then they, you know, so they might have these pockets of data, then when they leave, the knowledge goes with them. Really does open up companies to issues around um, you know, what? how are we doing that? What was the methodology behind collecting that data, transforming that data? Um, it makes it really difficult to utilise that data within the organisation as well. There's always a lot of stakeholders involved um, that, um, that need that information. Um, so if you don't have a good system around it, um, the poor enviro is the one that seems to never be able to take leave, yeah. never gets sick because they're the, they're the, um, the, the, the funnel, that, that choke point around being able to answer all those questions, let alone... Um, doing the the monitoring, let alone doing all the reporting that comes with it. Right, got it. Okay, so what what are the actions and the obligations that we're talking about here? Um, it's just so it's, it is really broad. Um, so yeah, th there's everything from it. Everyone always thinks about the monitoring you must be doing, you know, regular monitoring in this area. But then it comes down to you also need to be doing uh, baseline reports. You know, once usually like a uh, a compliance document goes live, then you need to be doing some sort of report within the first six months. You need to, if um, if a certain uh, condition happens, then you need to respond. So you need to perform actions in response to that, which is often some sort of, um, you know, Say, for example, there's they detect a, 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 a compliance exceedance in the field. They now need to do more frequent monitoring for the next month to make sure it's not a systemic action, or they might need to actually inform the government straight away. So right. there's not only is all this monitoring coming in, which they need to report you know, to people like the government, even the community, but also then how they report to their parent company, because there's always some sort of corporate reporting type metric reporting that needs to happen in, in the realm of environment, um, usually for the company's sustainability or ESG reporting. So there's just a lot of different types of um, activities that need to happen. So you can imagine just that whole myriad of, of, um, of different broad actions and uh, obligations is a lot to keep up with. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's interesting. So from the data to the people doing the um, data capture, right yep. through to the managers, right mm. through to government, right yep. through to the public. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and I guess it's it, if we don't have, if there's, if there's not the discipline, if there's not the um, the organisation. So I remember once we uh, we did an implementation and we loaded some data in and um, we plotted the information on a map and there was a, a, a sampling location in the middle of the ocean. 
and I think right. it was called like location two. And yeah, it was a great set of data, but yeah. no one knew where it was meant to be because there was multiple location twos in their data set. So this was where, you know, that um, not really having the uh, the processes in place, the governance of that data in place um, to have that context around it um, meant that they couldn't use it with the stakeholders. They were suddenly exposed and, and quite risky. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty interesting environment, especially when you throw in all of those activities. Um, keeping up with it is is quite a challenge. Yeah, nice example. So mm. what are the key ingredients <clears throat> to good environmental data management? Um, yeah, and I think obviously having a good storage mechanism I mentioned before is is critical. So you, you do need something that will scale that will really allow you to um, – store that broad variety of, of information and, and in one spot. So the last thing companies want these days is um, a point solution or something that's sort of standalones and, and doesn't play well with others. They want to tend to limit the number of systems they have. So they don't want to roll in a system just for water quality. They want and another one for air and another one for um, biodiversity. They want something that'll do everything. Um, but like we said before, it's not it's more than just about storing data. Um, we like to come back to what we call the three C's. Um, so it's um, compliance, completeness and context. Um, really important to say that um, you know, not only are we getting the data in, we're assessing the compliance of that data. So the performance of how, um, what the actual data is telling us around what we're doing uh, impacting the environment. So is it telling us we're you know, breaching our air quality guidelines? Is it tell us we're doing something adverse to the water table? All those sort of things. So that's our compliance element to it. Mm. Um, but that's great. Um, but what about completeness? So are we actually doing the activities that we're meant to be doing? And when I say meant to be, um, often the uh, compliance drivers aren't just saying, you know, you must be ensuring that the pH levels of the water is between these these uh, values. They're saying you must perform regular monitoring, and regular monitoring means this. And once you get that, you almost say it must have these things within limits. So there is that real duality of compliance and completeness. And we actually had a really good example of that. Um, one of our customers had gone away on leave for six months, uh, extended leave, came back and they had, had 100% compliance. He was thinking, oh, that's fantastic. Then he looked at the completeness score. He found out he only had about 10% of the data that he was meant to. So um, the data was saying, yeah, we're doing really good with our environmental performance. Unfortunately, what it also was telling him is that no one's been doing the activities that they're meant to be doing either. So um, real gotcha there. Um, the third one is context and context is more and more important these days. So and that's everything from, you know, do we have the complete data set? So is everything in here and monitoring that we should? You know, we find that when people are using spreadsheets or other systems that don't quite have the breadth, they'll be doing most of it in the system, but then they'll have Oh, what about the um, the noise data? Oh, that's in a spreadsheet over here. So then there'll be disparate things. So you won't be able to get a complete picture of um, of the data and, and of their um, environmental monitoring framework. Um, but also, you know, things about the location. You know, what is where is the location? So the spatial coordinates of that. You know, do we have uh, images of it? You know, do we have a historical record of that? Um, and also a data. Um, we've got these values, which are great. Where'd they come from? Uh, what quality processes were in place to get these? You know, uh, do we have the lab's QAQC report? You know, do we have a certificate of um, uh, uh, receipt of um, of sampling? Those sort of things as well for us, it's really important to have that context because, as I said, you know, you can do all this reporting, then someone you know invariably comes knocking at the door and says, "We can, we need to audit you, so we need to make sure that your data management process is in place." So, without making sure that you know the data that's coming in is being checked against their obligations to make sure they're doing all the right things, plus they can prove that it's gone through a right the, the proper process. Without those three C's, um, then you're really opening yourself up to risk. Yeah, great. I think you've just highlighted the the takeaway message for this podcast here which is the the compliance the completeness and the and the context and i can see that those are very uh, very important so mm. just uh thinking about the system so a health and safety environment community and hsec system yep. and then an environmental data management system an edms system can you can you tell us the difference between you know what are these systems are and then what's the difference between them yeah, absolutely. I guess, you know, the uh, health, safety, environment community or HSEC, 
you know, it's a broad term that we apply to largely the non-operating part of it, say a mining company. So all of those things in and around uh, that help support, um, you know, keeping the, the mine going, the uh, honouring the obligations, but also as you can see there, keeping people safe. Um, it's really important. And if anyone who's been onto a mine site will know that, you know, zero harm and um, looking after our people and making sure that um, if we've got things in place to, to safeguard against, that is hugely important that they're not exposed to health risks and those sort of things. So um, what people will potentially do then is say, hey, we need a H6 system. So there are some some large systems out there that which do the whole broad gamut of things, right? So um, what they will end up doing though is what we call the little e. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it's it's not enough just to have a glorified spreadsheet. So in that case, when someone goes out to get a full H6 system, they'll often end up with the, the glorified spreadsheet, the thing that just stores data, but doesn't really add value to it. It doesn't have the three Cs like we just talked about. Um, and so that will really um, affect their ability to um, provide all the that sort of rich context around it like we've talked about. Um, uh, an EDMS system um, is really um, a, a, a built for purpose system that can manage the broad um, gamut of, of environment like we've talked about. So it is really drilling into that E part of uh, HSEC to ensure that it's a big E, not a little E, that it does it well. And so the big E is something where it has the three C's that it really makes sure that um, you can answer that question at any point in time of are we compliant right now? So, you know, that's a, that's a real key. Um, it is something that you know, anecdotally will keep people up at night. Um, the, like I said, the poor Enviro managers just sitting there going, gee, I hope the data is going to tell us the right thing. I hope if we get audited, I can answer the questions. Um, having that makes you know, people's ability to, um, I guess, uh, report on and, and ensure that their HSEC um, framework is, is sound and, and at least that part of it will be done. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, got it. And this is really the, the fool's gold. That's the yep. topic of the story. This is the fool's gold that we're talking about. Got it. Yeah, um, that's look, right. I, I really love hearing case studies. Uh, is there yep. any, do you have any case studies that you can talk us through and just give us an example, something practical and tangible that people can, uh, you know, listening can can take away? Yeah, absolutely. And I guess it comes down to um, having the the full traceability and, and, and ability to to not only sit in the system and collect data, but also provide data as well. And I think that's the the real critical thing these days. Um, you talk to any company, you talk to their ID department, and they're like, well, do you have a way that we can interact with the system? So not only to get data in, but also getting data out, because there's always various stakeholders which we need to talk about. So one that comes to mind is a really good one. So I mentioned we have a lot of mining customers, but we also have a lot of water utility and council customers as well. Um, someone like the city of Gold Coast uh, have the system and they do all of their environmental monitoring, but also a lot around flora and fauna, biodiversity and the like. Um, so they do everything from um, uh, published data to a sustainability dashboard uh, that the community can look at. Um, they do internal reporting of, um, say, flora and fauna, uh, but also um, around koala monitoring. Uh, this is a, a really unique one, um, which we'd not come across um, before. We've, we've done some sort of um, uh, fauna monitoring before, but uh, not at this scale. So it's um, it's pretty cool because um, members of the public can actually, on the public portal uh, either in the city of Gold Coast, can actually lodge uh, sightings of koalas. Uh, yep. So when they see them, and, and unfortunately, it is also about collecting uh, mortality data as well. Um, yep. So they can enter, enter data into the, into the um, an online form, which actually gets put into our system, which then goes into uh, dashboards and studies and can be provided as data to to, to researchers, for example. So um, it's a really good example of of having that, that larger reader say, it's not just about storing the data, but how can we utilise that data in other places that is in, you know, we can sure that it was collected in the right way. Um, so, you know, it goes to show that context and breadth as well. It's not just around sometimes water and air, it's all of those other parts that um, that are very much around what um, the remit of, of what people need to be monitoring. Just for um, context, Stu, yep. could you just, just uh, for our international listeners, the city of the Gold Coast, Yep, uh, that's up, up on the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, it's actually a, a really large, um, it's a really large council, um, very much, very bio, very biodiverse. Um, and uh, funny enough, uh, the amount of data they've got in the system, we're talking like a huge data sets of, of all sorts of air quality, water quality, 
um, fauna and fauna. So it's uh, yeah, it's a pretty um, it's a they're ama they're an amazing customer. They really mm. have um, quite a uh, quite a um, interesting implementation, which um, yeah. is uh, they're doing some really good things with. Okay, you were talking offline about a, an iron ore miner, um, and I, I thought if you could expand on that example too, please. There's a it sounded like an interesting story there. Yeah, there's uh, another really good story of of having a big E because um, they they definitely do uh, a lot of different types of monitoring in there, but a lot of water quality and and uh, I guess water quantity type data as well. Uh, they are. Uh, well, they are actually bringing in um, lots of information uh, in near real time around, um, say, bore uh, levels and qualities and the like. Uh, they're actually utilising that data to make decisions daily about where they do their mining. Um, that data gets fed into a, a business intelligence um, model, which helps them make those decisions. So, you know, once again, it's about making sure, and, and they can they can do that because they trust the data. They can do that because they know where it's come from, where it's been stored, and the rigor around that. Um, you know, we're talking about making decisions on operations here, and as soon as we get into that realm, you know, that the the mining company will demand. Um, you know, completeness and mm -hmm. uh, demand the rigor around that data because they can't afford to make, you know, poor decisions in that area. Um, yeah. What they also do is um, link it to their, uh, what they also do is use it for um, their their sampling. Uh, they do have quite complex scheduling that they do. So, you know, like I said, the system's not just about collecting data, it's also about marshalling the activities that need to happen as well. Um, it's really cool. They used to have you know, spreadsheets with they, which they kept these in. As you know, the spreadsheets are relatively undynamic, so they're not scheduling the next things. It's all a manual process, and it's really prone to you know duplication. So, um, in what they might have done in the past, is said, look, we're not quite sure we've done that monitoring. Let's just do it again. Um, mm -hmm. And if anyone's been involved in that process, they know how expensive that can get. So, moving it into a system like ours has meant now they have that full visibility on their monitoring schedules they know when it's meant to be done they know when things have, have haven't happened they know the rules around what can be rescheduled and what can't what would actually constitute a non-compliance and what wouldn't so and they know all the data's there if they and then that feeds into something like um uh, reporting say to department of health um, so they can actually utilise this to say, and not just around um, you know, the the sort of what the data is telling us, but you know, have the activities been performed that it meant to? Are you doing that sort of thing? So you know, anecdotally, they've said to us, um, you know, doing this sort of stuff has saved them a massive amount of time. With something that might you know take us a month, a quarter is now taking us less than a week. So, mm -hmm. um, and they can do that now because they have the data, they trust it. They know it's been through the right rigor, um, and uh, it's really given them uh, a lot more confidence in around how they manage that. Very tangible and impactful. Yeah. That's yeah, very much so. Yep. Look, uh, one last question for you, Stu. Uh, the topic of ESG, so environmental, social, and governance. Uh, this topic is is everywhere, and and it remains at the top of Ernst and Young's top ten business risks and opportunities for mining and metals in. Yep. 2023 and i've noticed that water management is at the top of their list and it's under heavy scrutiny um can you can you just talk a bit about that can you say how can a mining company use an edms system like envirosis to manage their water management program yeah sure um and absolutely esg is the the hot topic um funny enough when you link anything to potential investment and money it becomes a hot topic and um i guess at its um at its core, it's around a framework of external reporting, um, and it really is a bit, a bit, of, a bit like a sustainability sort of frameworks. But it's, I guess, it's a bit more of a next level of that. Um, water quality, as we know, um, water is such a scarce resource. It's not the sort of thing you can just create, or um, you really have to manage it um, properly and very diligently. Um, and you know, having a system like ours, for all the reasons I've mentioned before allows you to do that so you don't have that wastage you know the categorization the uh, ways that we can um, ensure that we're in a timely manner um, making assessments on this and i guess this is something that i haven't mentioned earlier but the timeliness of data um, bringing it into an edms for example um, you know we've had a lot of people we come into they had problems around oh we get our consultants data like three or four weeks after they've done it after the month so they're all they're ever doing is being reactive and, and playing catch up. They're not getting right. the data in real time. They can't right. make decisions around that. So you can imagine if this is water management data, they're not making proactive decisions. They're almost just saying, oh, this is what went wrong. Hopefully we can make 
corrective measures in the future to not happen again, mm -hmm. as opposed to something's about to happen, we can mitigate that and and um, manage this you know, scarce resource. So a system like EDMS allows them to do that. The other really important thing as it links to ESG is that, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of ESG is around potential attractiveness to investment opportunities. So um, you need to be pretty careful about the sort of information that you're putting forward. It's not good enough to uh, have, there's a, uh, an interesting phrase of greenwashing, which means, you know, we, we're reporting what we think people want to hear without mm. much substance behind it. That's not acceptable. Uh, it never really has, but especially these days with the scrutiny on ESG. Um, yeah. So to do that, they need something behind it, which is defensible. That is, you know, we can link this right back to you. We can show you our workings, for example, uh, where it's come from, the importance of um, of all of the activities in and around that. Um, so, you know, something like an EDMS and an Envirosys really helps customers say, yes, the E part of the ESG, um, we can prove that this is our performance and our how we've been tracking in the past and in the future. So you've got that full historical um, spread. Um, but even the, you know, the G side with the governance, you know, you mm -hmm. can then show we're actually doing really good data governance, especially in this E area. So um, having an EDMS is, and, and I guess other systems in and around um, to have that sort of big E or big S or big G um, is super critical for customers, um, yeah. uh, for for go for companies to ensure that um, you know when people dig a little bit deeper, um, they can back it up. Yeah. Look, uh, Stu, the big takeaways I'm getting from this talk is that everything you're talking about here is very practical and tangible and mm. and, and usable, which is which is great. Um, yeah. Look, th thanks very much for that. Uh, I've had a really interesting chat. I yep. uh, just wanted to say I know you're heading across to Perth uh, next month in November yep. uh, and uh, you're going to be at the at the Acquire Connect Tech Summit. Summit. And uh, what, what's your talk going to be on, Stu? Um, funny enough, it's going to be putting the big E into ESG. So okay. uh, it'll be it'll be similar to what we talked about today, but we'll uh, once again really go into you know, why it's important what, and what does good look like? Um, yep. So I guess, you know, we haven't really touched on a huge amount of that today. We've talked in, yep. I guess, general, generalities, uh, but we'll talk about practically what does that look like? And I think that's a good point, Stephen. A lot of this is doable. It's, um, it's practical and that's the way we've definitely designed Enviruses. It needs to be practical. It can't be onerous. It can't be uh, a million workflows to do things. That doesn't work. We've seen it not work and fail in the past. So everything's about being practical and that's what we'll tap into in that chat. Great. Hey, Stu, thank you very much for your time today. It's really good talking to you and looking forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Thanks for listening to Acquire's podcast, The Gym Channel. Find us at acquire.com.au.